Hey everyone, this is Kenji, and today we're making a sausage and tomato ragu. So, you can think of this as kind of like the beginner's bolognese. Like, it's a, it's very, very simple, um, very few ingredients. Um, it's, it's better than your sort of typical, you know, like my mom, when I was a kid, made meat sauce by sautéing some ground beef and adding a can of, um, you know, Prego bottled, uh, jarred pasta sauce to it um, and calling them the simmering and calling it a day. And that's how I did it in college also. Um, this is more of a cross between a traditional um, ragu bolognese, which is made with um, generally with pancetta, beef, veal, pork, sometimes other meats that are all um, browned together and then simmered in milk uh, with a little bit of wine. Um, and, so, and, and, and just a touch of tomatoes. Um, a, real ragu, a real ragu bolognese is mostly a meat sauce with just a little bit of tomatoes. Um, this one's kind of a cross between a more traditional ragu bolognese and a simpler um, sort of Italian-American style meat sauce. Um, and the trick here is that we're using uh, bulk Italian sausage to give a lot of flavor to this dish without a ton of ingredients. So to start off, um, actually, you know what, to start off, I'm gonna, I, I got right here half a pound of um, Italian sausage and here half a pound of ground beef. I, the only reason I have a mix of two is because that's just what I happen to have in my fridge. Um, you can do all Italian sausage. In fact, you could do all ground beef if you want. Also, it just won't taste as, uh, as flavorful, but you can go all ground sausage. You can buy a pound of sausage and use that. Um, I'm just using a mix because that's what I have. So olive oil in a skillet. Um, we're gonna get our meats in there. start off by well we're gonna start off by cooking them first we're not necessarily gonna brown them there's, there's a couple schools of thought of thought on um, whether to deeply brown your meat or not um, when you're starting a ragu like this um, I know you know chefs like Mario Batali whose work I won't link to anymore but chefs like Mario Batali he says deeply deeply brown your meats um, whereas um, some more traditional bolognese recipes don't have you brown the meats as much um, and uh, you know, it really depends who you ask. Uh, my old chef, you know, when I was a when I was a line cook in Boston, I worked at a place called Number Nine Park. My old chef, Barbara Lynch, um, she uh, specialized in Northern Italian cuisine, which is where Bologna is. Um, and so I, you know, in the winter time, in the fall, and the winter, I was the one who made all the bolognese sauce for the restaurant. So I would make it. Um, you know, like 20 pounds of ground meat at a time. Um, and when I was doing it, we wouldn't deeply brown the meat. We would just li lightly brown it. So the trade-off is that by deeply browning, you get f more flavor. You get sort of more of those brown Maillard reaction flavors. Um, but your meat also comes out a little kind of tougher and a little grainier. Whereas if you don't brown it as deeply and you just simmer it um, in the sauce, you end up with a more sort of silky smooth texture. All right, so the other ingredients we're going with, a carrot. We're gonna do about half of a diced onion. Uh, so when you dice your onion, split it in half first, cut off the tip end like that, take off the skin plus the layer immediately underneath the skin because usually that layer is pretty tough too. Okay, clean that all off. And then you start by making um, vertical cuts. So I, I actually, um, a, I had a, a mathematician friend who I um, enlisted the help of and we made a, um, a model of an onion and calculated sort of what the most efficient way to get um, <clears throat> uh, relatively almost perfectly even dice we, we set certain tolerances like perfectly even dice almost perfectly even dice with the minimal number of cuts um, so some people say to go radially to the center that doesn't really work because then you end up with these tiny pieces in the center and bigger pieces on the outside um, some people say go straight up and down that doesn't really work either because you all then you end up with kind of long slivered pieces here. What we found was the optimal was basically about the golden ratio. So you imagine, so imagine that the height, the radius of your onion is one. So the top of the onion to your cutting board, that's one. And if you go down from there, 0.6, so that's around here. And that's kind of where you want to aim your cuts, your uh, first vertical cuts. And that's going to give you the most even uh, dice with the least amount of work. At some point, I will. We, we had a whole mathematical model set up where you could 
um, put in different, you know, well, we calculated it, but it, you, you, you'd set in you could put different tolerances for, for the sizes of pieces that you want and the number of cuts that you wanted to do. And then it would spit out, um, the position that you want to aim your knife when you're cooking. All right. So our meat is going there, browning a little bit. That's all right. Um, so this is what I use, uh, to break up meat, a pastry cutter. Some people use a potato masher. I find that a pastry cutter works much better. Um, if you're using a nonstick pan, which you can for this, if you're using a nonstick pan or something that you're worried about sort of scratching up too much, um, just be careful not to push all the way down to the bottom of the pan. Usually um, the meat kind of stops it from hitting the bottom of the pan anyway, so you're okay. And of course, if you're very worried about it, you can go in with a, a wooden spoon or, a, or one of these guys. This is a early wood. Uh, wooden spatula. Early wood is the company that makes these. Okay. So that's going on. I'll leave that in the sink for a second. So we're getting pretty close to where I want it. So not really too much browning. And, and if you notice, what I did was at the very beginning, I kind of left the meat in place for a while without really touching it. And that way, you do get some sort of browning on the, you know, sort of the large block of meat at the outset, and that's going to help develop flavor. But then um, uh, you don't really have too much overcooked meat. The rest of the meat kind of stays a little bit more tender and just gets simmered as opposed to really hard seared. Okay, so once that meat starts to turn that color, we're going to go in and add our carrots and onions. Um, if you happen to have a stock of celery handy, you could also add that here, but I find that for this kind of sauce, the carrots and the onions are really the, the vital part. The celery is, celery is kind of optional. Okay. Now we want to cook this until those carrots and onions soften. We don't want them to brown really, because we don't... We don't want to add any extra sweetness to this. We just want those to soften up. So they're going to sweat a little bit. And meanwhile, I'm going to grab my... Ooh, did I have something to throw my garlic there? All right. I'm going to grab my garlic. Let's go with like three cloves of garlic here. Cut off the bottoms. And do a smack, smack, smack. Smackaroo. Whack, whack, whack. Okay. Now we'll come back and give it an even harder whack. A whack and a smear. So on my channel, I have a recipe for a ragu bolognese that, well, that some Italians take exception to because I add a lot of non-traditional ingredients in it. Although you do have to remember that um, ragu bolognese is a, even the, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of debate about what goes into it even now. Um, so it's really hard to be a purist about something like that. Um, you know, the, the one thing I add in there that I think people really take exception to is fish sauce. Um, but I'm going to stand by it. It, uh, it's not a traditional ingredient. Um, even though the Romans did use fish sauce, um, they did not, the Romans did not invent ragu bolognese, so it's not even a traditional ingredient by, um, by those standards. Um, but it does bring out the meatiness of the dish, and so I think it's totally fine if you want to do it. I'm not going to put it into this one, but I would not fault anyone if they wanted to. Okay. Now our garlic's going to go in here. Vegetables are softening up. And so just about another minute of cooking is good here. Um, once the garlic goes in, you don't really want to cook it too much because that garlic will burn faster than, um, well, faster than anything else that's already in this pot. Uh, and so you don't want that garlic to start burning. So about, once you get the garlic in, about a minute max. So grab, 
fresh ground black pepper. My cousin lives in Bologna, um, and my wife and I took our daughter there um, a couple years ago. She was an infant um, and ate a lot of ragu bolognese and a lot of tortellini and broth. <clears throat> um, and we did find that, you know, there was pretty significant variation in the bolognese depending on where you got it, which restaurant you went to, although they all sort of followed the same basic blueprint. Bologna is a very rich city, well, traditionally a very rich city, which is why um, they, you know, the, the dishes there tend to be very meat and dairy heavy. All right, so next we're gonna add some wine. Um, you can do white wine, red wine, doesn't really matter as long as it's dry. Uh, I just have this bottle open, so I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna use this. It's about a cup of wine in there. Maybe a little more, a little more splash. Okay. And then I'm gonna open up this can of tomatoes. These are San, Mar San Marzano tomatoes. Um, this one happens to be crushed tomatoes, um, which I generally don't recommend buying because there's so much variation in their quality. But if you have a brand that you like and you know well, um, then of course it's totally fine to buy them. Um, this brand I know I like. I've had it, I've had it many times. It's excellent. Um, you know, one of the one of the advantages of crushed tomatoes is that when they are when it's a good brand, um, they tend to be better than any other kind of tomato because they are picked the ripest um, because they don't have to worry you know some other types of tomatoes they have to pick them when they're a little bit underripe so that they don't get smushy inside the can um, this one they're smushing them anyway so um, they tend to be picked the ripest which means that they are um, usually better quality or better flavor that is all right so once that wine is reduced by about half that's just a couple minutes here I'm gonna go ahead and add some tomatoes. So this is a lot more tomatoes than a uh, traditional ragu bolognese would have, um, and that's because this is not a traditional ragu bolognese. So this is gonna be about you know half meat, half tomatoes, whereas a you know a real ragu bolognese would be mm, maybe one part meat to a quarter of a part tomatoes. All right, we just got one more ingredient, and that is milk. I'm gonna add about a cup of milk to this. You could also use cream or half and half if you if that's what you've got and that's what you wanna use. Doesn't matter too much. You know what, and while I'm at it, because I've got them, um, I've got a bunch of these, got a bunch of Parmesan rinds that I, you all save your Parmesan rinds, right? Of course you do. All right, so we're gonna drop in a couple of these Parmesan rinds. And that's going to give it some more richness and flavor. Now, all it takes is a little bit of time. See how easy that was? Um, so, I'm going to bring this up to a simmer, bring it up to a boil, reduce it to a bare simmer, and then let it simmer on the stovetop for a couple hours. Um, stirring it every once in a while just to make sure that it doesn't burn. Um, but that's about it. It's going to come to a boil. Uh, I'm going to reduce it to a simmer. I'm going to let it go and then I will see you again in one hour. And this is what you got. So basically reduce it until you want to reduce it until you start seeing um, some of the fat. So you can see if you look close here, you can see some of that fat starting to uh, separate out. That's a sign that a lot of the water content, um, which is, you know, comes from both the meat and the vegetables as well as the wine and the milk, that a lot of that is um, on the verge of evaporating away and so there's not enough of it left to form a stable emulsion with the fat. And you want to stop it right before it gets to the point where that emulsion breaks. So when you start to see little bits of fat pooling out on the surface um, and it's really nice and rich and thick like this, that's when you're done. Um, and now a sauce like this, you know, it's, it's great in lasagna. I'm going to put a recipe for a lasagna up actually at, at some point, either before, maybe it all, maybe it's already up. I don't know what order I'm putting these yet, but. Mm. Hot. Um, it's great for lasagna. Um, it's also great for sort of any kind of thick, either thick or thick tubular pasta. So something like tagliatelle or, um, or pappardelle or, um, Penne, penne rigate, 
And anything that's sort of thick and will sort of sop up, take take up big chunks of meat with it. Um, you don't want to do this on something like an angel hair noodle. Um, other than that, you know, put it on whatever you want. Um, it's also great like on top of, mm, you can bake eggplants with this on top of it. I think that's delicious. You can bake all kinds of vegetables, other, you know, zucchini, eggplants, squash. <clears throat> you can eat it on its own with a spoon. You can serve it on a baked potato. You can serve it on pieces of toasted bread rubbed with garlic. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's good all around. All right. Um, do I need to get like a beauty shop by the window of this? I don't really know. It's funny, the dogs did not smell this cooking today. I don't know where they are. Oh man, doesn't that look good? And really, really easy. Honestly, like, I think it was like about 10 minutes of actual, well, you'll know from the time of the video, but there's about 10 to 15 minutes of actual work and the rest is just sitting there waiting for it to simmer down. Um, and you wind up with something that is, well, delicious, delicious. Hmm, it's great. All right. All right, my friends, I'll see you next time.